my name is Kate McCaffrey and I am the newly appointed assistant curator at Hever Castle in Kent. I just recently completed my master's degree at the University of Kent, where I uncovered some exciting new evidence about one of Anne Boleyn's books of hours, which is held at Hever. And so I'm going to be continuing with that research going forward in my new role um, at the castle. That's right. For our final episode of Elizabeth the First Month, we are joined by Kate McCaffrey, a wonderful historian who works at Hever Castle and recently discovered some new information about Anne Boleyn's Book of Hours and a connection to Elizabeth I. So sit back and enjoy our conversation with Kate McCaffrey. Thank you, Kate McCaffrey, so much for joining us. I'm delighted to have you here to talk about some of your new research and the recently uncovered secrets surrounding Anne Boleyn's Book of Hours. It's a wonderful piece. I've been fortunate enough to see it a couple of times, but to actually hear from you is a real treat. So thank you so much for being here. Now, it occurs to me that maybe some of our listeners don't know how Anne Boleyn or others would have used a book of hours. So can you tell us a little bit about how that book might have been used? Yes, absolutely. I think it's um, it's always good to start with a little intro into what books of hours actually were. So I think if I was sort of to most succinctly describe them, it would be as a scriptural prayer book. Um, and they were used very, very often in the medieval and early modern period. I think most historians would agree that they are one of the first popular, truly popular books um, of the medieval era. And they were traditionally Catholic texts um, containing mainly Latin prayers, although this copy, interestingly, has uh, some prayers in English, so in the vernacular. Um, And they really did govern, I think, so many aspects of everyday life, which is sort of hard for us to understand now. Um, But they were called Books of Hours because they contained certain prayers to be said at certain hours of the day. So it literally was a way to kind of govern your day through this one book. Um, And so Anne and ladies and men like her would really have used this book um, a lot of the time. It would have been a very special possession to own. And I think something that's interesting, particularly with the connection Books of Hours have with women, is that there does seem to have been this special relationship between women and Books of Hours, in that I think it was a very appropriate um, outlet for female literacy and religious thought um, in what was obviously a world of rather limited opportunities for women to engage with religion and literature. So I think women are often associated with books of hours in this kind of special relationship and um, Anne and other noble or certainly royal women like her would have had owned multiple copies of a book of hours. So we know that Anne herself owned three, um, which she's written in, two of which are at Hever and the other is at the British Library. Um, And that was certainly not unusual. We know that Catherine of Aragon had multiple copies. Elizabeth of York had multiple copies. um, And that was largely due to their sort of peripatetic lifestyle, the fact that they were constantly on the move. You'd often have a copy in different locations that you'd move to. And so, so yeah, they were were highly important, highly used texts. um, And I think, yeah, it's important for us to try and understand today how beloved these possessions would have been. That is wonderful. I I really appreciate that because um, I think the idea of, we, we call it a book of hours, but I'd never really thought exactly why. So yes, it was something to do yeah. every hour and it planned the day. Absolutely. We, we have different kinds of planners now that are much, I think, less religious in nature, probably for most yeah. of us. <laughs> but it is, that's an easy way for us to sort of relate to it. This was how the day was planned. So um Absolutely. So I did think of a question, actually, as you were speaking. I um, used to work, and now I'm a reader, at the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C. And the director 
<clears throat> yes, thank you. It's it's a, it is wonderful. Um, yes. Dr. Michael Whitmore was speaking a while ago of some of some pieces in the collection that were owned by nuns, and they were actually mm. doing DNA testing because as wow. part of the worship, the nuns kissed the books. Yes, yes. And, and so they were trying to lift, you know, so I wondered if any of the, the books of ours that you're familiar with have, yes. you know, been DNA tested or if there are, you know, people use very interesting things as bookmarks or whatever, but they would have held them. They may have held them close. Um, yeah. I don't know if you kissed a book of ours. I don't know that much yeah. about the you know, the worship and the traditions, but I just wondered if that had ever been done or considered for these books as well. Yeah. I mean, that's so, so interesting. You bring that up because I think the ways in which people interacted with these books um, is almost a bit alien to us now, but is so fascinating. Um, and I studied as my part of my master's degree, I studied paleography and code ecology. So really looked into the history of books and mm -hmm. and I found that kind of area of interaction the kind of haptic intervention so interesting and books of ours absolutely I would say are included in that in the way that people would have interacted with them um, very sadly DNA testing has not been done yet though I will say yet on um, Heaver's books of ours but we are uh, always looking at new ways to try and find information from them especially after my research so that's a very interesting avenue that might be worth exploring but from me just holding the book and looking through it in a close study there's even a lot of evidence there of how these people interacted with the books and I think something that's key to remember there is um, literacy obviously at this time was something that was um, not standard at all and not widespread especially amongst women and we know that it was a lot of women who used Anne's book after her, um, thanks to my new research. And so I think it's important for us to remember as well that even if they could read, these books were primarily written in Latin. And so if they could read English, it's less likely that they would be able to read and understand Latin. And I think that uh, they probably would have been able to recognize uh, the Latin prayers from church from having heard them be spoken but uh, actually reading them would have been a different situation. And so what we can see in the printed book of ours, which is the one I've worked with most closely, is uh, prayers, certain prayers which have faded considerably in comparison to others, certain pages which have had their corners turned down or have had parts rubbed away. Um, and I think this is definite evidence of um, osculation, like you said, so the kissing of the page or the rubbing, devotional rubbing was also very much something that people would do to kind of physically interact with prayers as they were reciting them or as they were reading them. Um, and so there's definite evidence of that. And what's quite interesting with um, this particular book and knowing its ownership with Anne and then woman close to her after her is that the most evidence I have found of that kind of devotional interaction, the kind of rubbing, um, and kissing has come from the English prayers in the book, um, which I think is sort of highly suggestive of what we know now about Anne's religious leanings. But I think it's also highly suggestive of the literacy um, and sort of Latin fluency or lack of Latin fluency from the people who read the book after her. Obviously, English prayers were that much more accessible uh, despite your religious affiliations. And so those ones have definitely been used more. Um, it's very interesting. And actually, there are certain images as well, obviously being a, a much easier sort of aspect of the book to interact with if you weren't literate. And certain images have definitely been rubbed uh, more than others. And that's the same for our other book of ours, our manuscript as well. So, so it's a really fascinating topic just to see kind of how these people interacted with the books just beyond your sort of average reading. Right. And you, you raised a really interesting question about the religious affiliation because, mm. you know, initially the traditional Catholic religion did not want the Bible certainly translated mm. into English. And so was it acceptable for these prayers to be in English? And it sounds like, you know, that was one of the key ways these women were able to interact with some religious text was through those English prayers. So was that seen as acceptable? 
yeah, I think that's it's really interesting considering kind of the tensions that were around uh, religion at this point, and particularly uh, books and prayers and Bibles in the vernacular tongue. I think that initially I thought it would have been really unusual that that these these uh, books contained English prayers because they are predominantly written in Latin. Um, but then I found across my other studies of the same printing that it, it it wasn't just Anne's copy that had the English prayers. The English prayers were in Catherine of Aragon's copy, which was another discovery of my work that she owned the same book. Um, and obviously Catherine of Aragon, we know very much as being very traditional in her religious beliefs. Um, although the prayers in her book, the English prayers are a lot less well used than the ones in Anne's. Okay. But I think that it it was becoming... Uh, more acceptable to have specific prayers written in the vernacular tongue, not the whole text, certainly not the whole text. But I think it's only about four or five prayers that were written in English. And I think it definitely seems to have been amongst the the women who owned the book after Anne very much a way for them to interact with the book in a way uh, that suited their literacy levels because they were sort of a slightly lower nobility than than some other owners of the book and so likely were less educated as well. Right. And you you bring up something that you also discovered that that same printing of the book was owned by Anne and Catherine of Aragon. And it's possible, and I believe you said even likely, Mm -hmm. that they would have been perhaps in the same room at the same time Mm -hmm. reading their books. Just an interesting connection between those two women whom we think of as having such very different religious practices, which they did, but here's a, here's a bringing them together. So can you say a little bit about that? Because I think that's just an element of the complex nature of these individuals that so often gets sort of flattened into, we see them in only one dimension. And I think this gives us a, a really interesting clue into something these two women in particular shared. Absolutely. No, I think it's it's such an interesting point of unity between these two queens who, as you mentioned, we often see as so kind of disparate and so much as rivals. We often see them pitted against one another, really. Sort of Catherine, the wife, the Catholic, good Catholic wife, and Anne, the sort of um, Protestant mistress who was sort of much more uh, radical and rebellious. And I think there's a lot more that united them um, then we really give them credit for, to be honest, at the moment. And so I think this book, the fact that I know now, we know now that they both owned a copy of this same book is something really special in terms of realising that, that this is a moment of unity in also the context of the time, which was, so 1527, this book was printed for use in 1528. And so This is a very, very, very pivotal moment um, in the kind of changing structure of the Henrician court at this point where Anne, you know, her star is very much on the rise and Catherine's is on the wane. At this point, Anne has likely accepted the king's uh, proposal of marriage and Henry has very much decided that his marriage to Catherine is over. So Mm -hmm. the fact that both of these women at such a time of sort of personal turmoil in their personal lives um, owned this same prayer book and likely used it together, I think is really a compelling image. And I think that, um, that they certainly would likely have used it together um, or very much in the same vicinity. I think when it was handed out, it seems to me to have been handed to um, Catherine and members of her household Obviously, if Anne was one of those members at this point in time. And so I think that uh, group reading, especially amongst women, was often a very common court activity or domestic activity as well. It was seen, again, as a kind of appropriate outlet for female reading was to kind of read together. Um, and so I think it's highly likely that these books were uh, read in a in a group with Catherine and members of her household and her ladies and, and that Catherine and Anne even together in a moment, shared that kind of very peaceful moment of prayer, despite all of the the craziness going on in their personal lives, which is really, really compelling. Well, it is. And it it just reminds us that they were both very devout religious women, which we Absolutely. often lose with Anne Boleyn. You know, she's cast as a homewrecker Absolutely. or 
you know, ambitious as if you cannot be ambitious and religious both, but, <laughs> you know, we lose that part. But I, I think that's one of the really compelling things about your research is that idea that they shared much of their mm -hmm. worship and it was a personal devotional kind of worship. So thank Absolutely. you. Uh, no, of course. It's really, I think it's such, yeah, a really interesting connection. And I think it's important, like you said, to remember those, those moments where they weren't so different and, and they were both incredibly educated and intelligent and pious women in their own rights. Right. And, you know, they, you can see why the same man would have been drawn to the two of them. They did have Catherine and Anne, many shared characteristics Absolutely. Um, that we lose track of. I think the, the soap opera aspect of the story sort of takes over and we lose, you know, I think some of the real, elements of it. So thank you for that. Now, I, I'd like to also ask about some of the other women. So we know Anne had the book and we believe, thanks to your research, that she then passed it mm -hmm. to a friend of hers. So can you tell us a little bit about what you discovered and what that was like to discover that on those pages <laughs> And then some of the women, the, the other women's stories, this is just such a great way of seeing women's lives. And so can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. Yes, there it was. Oh, it's just been such a crazy experience, this whole kind of research and uncovering um, of this new evidence. And I was very lucky um, to be able to work with the books in the first place because I um, Heva's wonderful curator, Alison Palmer, is very rightly protective over the books, but um, she did let me uh, work with them. And uh, during the process of that kind of close study, I managed to uncover evidence of four further inscriptions within the printed Book of Hours, which we previously thought contained only one inscription, and that was Anne's herself, her famous rhyming couplet, the remember me when you do pray that hope doth lead from day to day. Um, but I uncovered the remnants of um, four further inscriptions, which had then later been erased. So I was able under ultraviolet light um, and using photo editing software. It took me a very long time, but I did manage to recover partial transcriptions, if not full transcriptions for each of the inscriptions. Unfortunately, in areas, the erasure of the inscriptions has been so uh, violent that I think a full transcription will remain elusive. But I have probably most importantly managed to get the names, the signatures of each uh, author of an inscription. And so it's that that's allowed me to kind of uh, reconstruct the path that this book took in the years after Anne's ownership. And as you say, I think that that was a, uh, a community of women primarily. So four out of the five inscriptions within the book, including Anne's, were written by women. Um, and I believe that they are all connected by kin, um, close kin and friendship. Um, they're all members of one very closely knit local Kent gentry family. And I believe that the connection between them and Anne herself, and so therefore the person that Anne likely passed this book to before it went to these other owners is through a woman named Elizabeth Hill, um, who was born and raised in Sundridge in Kent, which is only seven miles away from Anne's childhood home at Hever. And um, I think it's, you know, likely that these families, she was born Elizabeth Isley, the daughter of Sir Thomas Isley of Sundridge and Elizabeth Shirley, who is one of the authors of an inscription within the book. And I think it's likely that these families were obviously known to the Berlin's at Hever. Perhaps it's even possible that Elizabeth Hill and Anne knew each other before, uh, you know, in their childhood days before they were both at court. But we do know that Elizabeth Isley then became Elizabeth Hill when she married Richard Hill, who was the sergeant of the king's cellar um, in the late 1520s. And so sort of all around the time of Anne's rise um, to kind of court prominence. And she appears in several New Year's gift roles as Mrs. Hills. And we have uh, quite a lot of uh, amusing anecdotal evidence to suggest that uh, the Hills were close to Anne and the king. And there's a really amusing one from the 1534 uh, Privy Purse Expenses of Henry VIII, where he 
uh, where it's recorded that Richard Hill, so Elizabeth's husband, actually beat Anne in a game of bowls and so owed her quite a substantial amount of money. And so I think that's something that really we can use to show that these families were in kind of close contact with each other and were valued by each other. And so to me, it seems most likely that that Anne passed her copy of the book to Elizabeth Hill, who was her friend from court and possibly even from childhood. Um, and then Elizabeth Hill kept Anne's book safe in the hands of uh, female members of her close family. Great. I, I love that. Do we know, and I want to go on to more of the family in a second, but do we know when Anne would have given this book to Elizabeth? It was so important. It seems like it must have been sort of late in Anne's life if it was that important to her. Mm. So, yeah. I mean, I've heard a story that Anne took a book with her up onto the scaffold <laughs> for execution. So I'm just wondering, I mean, yeah. do we know? I mean, I think personally, unfortunately, that this book is not the book that Anne had with her on the scaffold. If indeed she did have one, there are reports of her having one there and then gifting it to uh, Mary Wyatt, to one of her ladies. I think that that legend is most often attached to a book of Anne's, a very small girdle book, which is held at the British Library. Um so there's no kind of clear cut evidence to suggest that Heaver's printed book is is the one that she may have had on the scaffold, although it is a lovely notion. But I think it's it's probably likely that Anne passed it um, before she ever made it to the scaffold. She passed it to Elizabeth Hill. It's hard to date exactly when. I mean, I think Anne's inscription within the book must have been at some point before the end of 1529 when her father became the Earl of Wiltshire and she likely would have signed her name Anne Rochford instead of Anne Boleyn. Um, so it's it could really be at any point after that that she's passed the book on. Um, but to me, the way that it's kind of been kept secret in the hands of this family and kind of in this kind of covert circle of women, it seems more likely something that she did pass nearer to the end of her life, perhaps when she realised um, that her life was even in danger. Okay. Yes, it, it's okay. I can see that. Well, I guess I'll give up my little fantasy that it was. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hey, it's, it's still possible, absolutely still possible, but I, I couldn't claim it. <laughs> okay. But, but it does seem that maybe toward the end of her life, she would have wanted these special things um, cared yeah. for. So that's great. That's perfect. And thank you. And can you tell us more about some of the other women and how this path might lead to Elizabeth the first Anne's daughter, because that's the really magical part. It's all magical, but I think that's an especially magical part of the story. It really is. I think that's when I kind of came across that connection. I think that was my most emotive uh, part of my research. Um, but yes, so the other, the other women, the other members of this family who kept the book safe, they all revolve around uh, the Guildford family from Cranbrook in Kent. So they were all the daughters or granddaughters of Sir Richard Guildford um, and his first wife, Anne Pimp. And he was quite a prominent uh, politician at court under Henry VII and then Henry VIII as well. And his sons, uh, Edward and Henry Guildford, were also both uh, prominent uh, members of court under Henry VIII and were friends of his. But it's actually the women of that family who are most interested in um, in regards to this book. And they are Elizabeth Guildford, who first married Thomas Isley of Sundridge and later married Richard Shirley of Whiston in Sussex. And that's when she became the Elizabeth Shirley that is, has signed her name in, in the Book of Hours. Um, and then the other woman is her sister, Philippa Guildford, who later married Sir John Gage, who was a prominent politician um, under Henry VIII and then later into the reign of Mary I. And uh, she became Philippa Gage, and that's another of the names in the book. The only male name within the book is actually John Gage himself, so he has also written within the book. And then the final name is Mary West, and there are a couple of Mary Wests around at this time. Um, but I think it most likely is the niece of Philippa Gage and Elizabeth Shirley. So the daughter of their brother, George Guilford, and 
there it seems to have been passed sort of from Elizabeth Shirley, uh, from Elizabeth Hill to her mother, Elizabeth Shirley, to her sister-in-law and brother-in-law, Philippa and John Gage, and then on to their niece, Mary West. Um, and so, yes, it's very much seems to have stayed within these kind of close, trusted connections of this Kent gentry family. And I don't think it's a coincidence that Anne chose to give this book to a family from Kent who were around her at Hever and around her family at Hever. I think there's something very poetic in that, um, that the book kind of stayed in those close circles around her family home. That's wonderful. And you do like to think of Anne having someone she could trust at the end, I think is really nice because so many people had turned against her and that these people would then collectively preserve something that was Mm -hmm. important to her. Absolutely. I think, yeah, that's the thing. I think it's important for us to remember how brave an act that was really for these women in this family at this time, because obviously after Anne's execution, she was uh, widely discredited and and Henry VIII attempted almost a systematic erasure of her from history. And so I think the very fact that they held on to a book which had Anne's name and her note inside is in itself a real act of solidarity and bravery and loyalty and even defiance against Henry. And so it's there's some really compelling personal stories in there as well. Um, and one of those, obviously, is, like you mentioned earlier, the link to Elizabeth I, um, which is probably historically unprovable, but is absolutely highly likely and uh, a really emotional connection. And that is the very likely possibility that Elizabeth was able to, when she herself was queen, was able to hold this book of hours um, and view her mother's signed note within it, um, which is just so touching to imagine um, because obviously Anne and Elizabeth's relationship is something that we don't have huge amounts of evidence um, towards, but we do very much know that Elizabeth, even if publicly she couldn't kind of claim her uh, Berlin heritage as much as she might have liked to privately, she very much cherished those connections. And I think this would be another way in which she was able to do that. And the link there does come through the daughter of Elizabeth Hill. So the connection between Anne uh, and the other owners of the book. So it's it's quite touchingly echoed, I think, that Anne passed her book to her friend, Elizabeth Hill, and then Elizabeth's daughter, Mary Hill, was able to show this book likely to Anne's daughter, to Elizabeth I. And so it's kind of yeah, touchingly echoed across generations, this friendship. But Mary Hill herself married uh, Sir John Cheek, who was one of the childhood tutors of Elizabeth I. And so even after John Cheek's death, Mary uh, Cheek stayed very much within the high esteem of Elizabeth I. And she remained a very close confidant um, and close friend of Elizabeth's up until the Queen's death. Um, And I think it's very likely, as we know, that this book was kept within the hands of Mary's family, that she would have shown it to her close friend, Elizabeth, um, both as an expression of friendship and, and and to want to share her mother's note with Elizabeth, but also, I suspect, in a show of loyalty, because it proved that her family had remained loyal to the Boleyns and to Elizabeth, despite all of the turmoil of the years in between. Yes, and, and that just seems like a wonderful moment between the two women and for Elizabeth herself because she was protective as much as she could be of her mother's Mm -hmm. image and memory and and this is another group of people who were protective of her mother's image and memory and that just seems Mm -hmm. such a lovely I just think it has to be true even if there's no firm evidence Yeah, but I think honestly, I think it's as as likely as it as it could be. I think it's it makes no sense for why Mary Hill would not have shown this book to Elizabeth, considering how close they were personally. Um, And as you said, how we know that Elizabeth did privately treasure her her relationship with her mother and her Berlin side of of her family. And I think it's really moving to think that, that Elizabeth might have been able to see her her mother's signed note. It's a kind of snatched moment, snatched mother, mother-daughter moment across time. Well, and I love that. It's it's two mother-daughter 
pairings. Yes. You know, two mothers who are friends. And I know, you know, with my daughter and her friends and I'm friends with the moms and it's just this wonderful, yeah. you know, com- little tiny community. And so to think of yeah. that is, is really wonderful. It is. So let me, let me ask you another thing. If, and I know we are imagining things now and that's fine. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I have now I'm very much luckier than Elizabeth because I was able to grow up knowing my mom and yeah. knowing my grandmother, but I have a Bible of my mom's with her handwriting in it. Wow. And I have a textbook of my grandmother's from her college wow. life. That's her Shakespeare okay. collection. Yes, so I that's have to good. tell you, it it got shared with my colleagues at the Folger. It's just, absolutely it's it's not a fancy collection, but my grandmother's notes about the plays as she was reading them are just so wonderful to me. And not that she had, mm-hmm. I mean, she's a really wise woman, but it's not that she had any brilliant insight or whatever. But yeah. You could tell what play she liked. And the same with my mom's Bible. You could tell what verses were really mm-hmm. important to her. Yeah. So if we imagine Elizabeth looking at her mother's book, and so I know you've looked at it, Mm -hmm. Are there particular, obviously the inscription would have been Mm -hmm. absolutely top, but are there other things in that book that you have seen that you maybe think might have been particularly meaningful, either pages that you've seen that other Mm -hmm. women have rubbed or what can you share with us about maybe some of the little elements of the book that might have been, and I know we're speculating, but that might've been meaningful to Elizabeth or, or that seemed especially meaningful to Anne. Yes. Well, I think that's, first of all, that's fabulous that you've got both your mother's Bible and your grandmother's textbook with annotations. I just think that's, and that's why I love books of ours because it's, they often do have written annotations in it and it's such an intimate insight into the kind of a personality and and habits of reading of those people um and so in terms of this particular book of ours I think like I mentioned earlier the the English prayers themselves are probably the most well used throughout the whole book um and that's likely from Anne and the woman after her so I suspect that especially again considering religious affiliations in Elizabeth's time because books of ours did fade out of production during Elizabeth's reign um, because they were so sort of associated with Catholicism Um, but we know obviously that Elizabeth promoted the vernacular in religious texts and so I think she would have been personally drawn to the English prayers um, as as well as the fact that they'd clearly been most used and most loved and then aside obviously from Anne's note herself, the inscription. There's Mm -hmm. also a particular page stands out to me, uh, which has lots of evidence of use in different ways, but it has three very distinctive uh, sort of circular marks um, of remnants of candle wax, which obviously indicate that this page was used at nighttime and, and the candle wax had dripped down onto it as someone was reading it um, at candlelight and they are um, very specific prayers uh, to the Virgin Mary. And I, I like to think that that candle wax is from, from Anne reading it before bed uh, at night time. And I think that that's, that's, again, a very visible sign of use, which Elizabeth perhaps uh, would, have, would have been drawn to as well in seeing her mother's um, habits of reading there and, and her love of those particular prayers. Oh, I think that's wonderful. I love that little detail of the candle wax. That just Mm -hmm. opens up a whole beautiful image, doesn't Doesn't it? It really does. It really sets the scene, I think. Oh, and that reinforces, we all know the such importance of the the book itself, not just the words in it, but the book itself Mm -hmm. and the story Mm -hmm. that's contained in that physical object. Absolutely. So yeah, that's a wonderful moment. Thank you for sharing that because I think that's a wonderful thing to imagine. And again, more likely than not, given what we know of these women who took such great care of this book and that they were also very important at court and close to Elizabeth, how could they not have shared it? So it certainly makes much more sense than not. Perfect. Exactly. (laughs) So is there one, I really appreciate all your time. Is there one 
thing that you are really looking forward to exploring next? Because it's so wonderful that you're at Hever now and that you have the opportunity to continue. So what are you excited about next? Oh gosh, that's, oh, there's so many things. <laughs> there's so many things um, coming up in the next couple of years that I'm really excited for both around this research and around my work with HEVA. Um, I do have some personal um, things in the works in terms of more uh, more research being um, accessible for more people coming from me, hopefully uh, in the near future. And in terms of HEVA, we're working very hard, uh, the wonderful Dr. Owen Emerson and I, and our curator, Alison Palmer, uh, we're all working very hard at the moment to produce an exhibition that we are going to have uh, starting next year, early next year. And that will be on elements of my research um, and particularly on the connection uh, between Anne and Catherine um, and the, the kind of link between those two queens. So that's going to be the first of a few exhibitions that we're going to hold at Hever, And there's going to be some exciting things on display um, that will be accessible uh, in person at Hever and also in a catalogue that we're going to write alongside it. So that's a little sneak peek into what's coming up soon. Well, I can see that we all that are in the U.S. now need to start our savings. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And get this COVID thing done so we can get back <laughs> to England. Yes, please do. <laughs> so thank you so much, Kate. I appreciate your time and all of your research I think this is such a great example of how alive history is because yeah. this is such new, exciting insight into people that we maybe thought we already knew, but here's yes. something new about them. Exactly. Exactly. I think it shows like for any historians or Tudor enthusiasts of, or enthusiasts of any historical period, I think it's it's just really refreshing to remember that there's always new things to be found and new perspectives to be seen on people, even if it's been done a thousand times before. Sometimes all it needs is a new set of eyes or a new take on something. And there's always more there to dig up. So it's all, it's all been very exciting. Well, it is. And we appreciate all of your work. And it's wonderful. I, I feel like these women who were this little network of supporters of Anne are coming out of the shadows a little bit. And it's, yes. it's just always, for me, so exciting to see these women. You don't, you know, they're behind the scenes sometimes, but boy, they are doing really amazing things. And as you said, this was a brave thing to do, given the time. Definitely. And I, I love that. And I just think it's great. So thank you so much for joining us and sharing with us. Now tell our listeners where they can find you. So you can find me on Twitter, which is at Kate E. McCaffrey. Um, and you can also find my website uh, with my blog posts about my research and other content that will be coming soon. And that is kateemccaffrey.wordpress.com. So do stay tuned. Okay. And I will include those links in the show notes. Thank you again, Kate. This has just been a treat for me. And I, I have a whole list of reasons to go to Hever, but this is now another bright <laughs> shining to come and see that exhibition. So thank you very much. So, thank you for having me. It's been a joy to talk about it with you. Big thank you to Kate McCaffrey for joining us and sharing her research about Anne Boleyn's Book of Hours and Elizabeth I. And thanks to all of you. I hope you've enjoyed this month's deep dive into Elizabeth I. Now for next month, by the pricking of my thumb, something wicked this way comes. Yes, for October, we'll be exploring witches in the Scottish play and in history. I hope you'll join us for that. And please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast, leave a rating, and let me know what you think. And if you're interested in being even more involved, check out our Patreon page. And let's keep shaking up history together.